Gia is a seventh year real estate associate at her firm. She's smart. She's, she's got excellent legal skills. She's definitely a rising star. And in addition to learning to be a good attorney, she's also going out of her way to build a reputation in the community, in the industry, to network with people that she's met at conferences, people from law school. She's really doing everything she can to not only be an excellent lawyer, but to also develop her networking and business development skills. It also so happens that Gia comes from a well-known family in Southern California. And as a result, she is able to broker new clients to her firm. She's just got a really great knack for understanding the needs of those professionals in her network and connecting them with her firm to solve those issues. During a, during a recent performance review with her practice group leader, who happens to be a boomer, Gia announced to the boomer practice group chair that uh, she'd like monetary credit for the work that she is originating to the firm. And we're talking about like 1.1, $1.2 million of originated work, not 50 grand. She also sprung on the practice group chair that even though she's a seventh year associate, she'd like to be considered for partner. So for those of you on the call that are a little more senior, imagine being in the practice group chair's position and this associate has these two demands of you. Imagine what your typical response would be. And you can probably imagine what the practice group's chair, the practice group chair's response was. He essentially told Gia that it wasn't her time yet and that the firm was very appreciative of everything that she was doing to bring work into the firm, but that she essentially needed to stay in her lane until it was time. Uh, Gia, as you can probably expect, after her performance review, walked across the street in Century City, California to a competing firm where she took a meeting with that firm's recruiting department and got hired on as partner where she was being recognized for the work that she was originating to the firm. And by the way, Gia only continued to thrive at that new organization. She continued to book a build, uh, build a book of business. She continued to learn the skills that it takes to be an excellent provider of legal services. She continued to build her network. She continued to thrive in all those areas that are of interest to her that this new environment actually encouraged rather than holding her back. So with estimates that as many as 40% of the entire US lawyer population at or very near retirement age, the topic of succession planning is or should be at the forefront of most law firms. So the boomer practice group leader in this case was operating from the traditional law firm model that he built his practice on. Today, we'll discuss the common mindset of boomer generation founders and the practice succession challenges often found at these firms. We'll focus today's discussion on how the next generation of attorneys can proactively participate in the succession process considerations in valuing practice and law firm assets, ways to initiate discussions surrounding transition and succession planning and critical timeline considerations when it comes to successful uh, practice transition. So joining us in our discussion today are two forward thinking attorneys currently navigating the succession process in their firms. Welcome Randy, will you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Randy Leff. I'm the managing partner of Irvin Cohn and Jessup. We're a mid-sized firm, full-service firm in Beverly Hills, California. Thanks, Randy. And Jason, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Thanks. My name is Jason Lyon. I am a commercial litigation partner at Han and Han, which is a small, mid-sized, full-service firm based in Pasadena. Welcome. And Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan Fitzgerald, Managing Partner of Equinox Strategy Partners. We work with lawyers and law firms on a daily basis to coach their attorneys to develop their practices and to um, establish the visibility within their industry or within their marketplace that will lead to new business. 
And I'm Lana Manganello. I work with Jonathan at Equinox Strategy Partners, mostly through coaching and training of, of lawyers in uh, an effort to boost their visibility and reputation, stay top of mind with their potential clients and referral sources, and ultimately increase top line revenue. So Jonathan, why don't we begin by discussing the various options for firm succession? Great. Yeah. And for any of you that have questions during the presentation, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A bar. And to the extent that we can pay enough attention to address them and, and time permitting, we'll go ahead and do those in real time. There are essentially two options for succession planning. One option is to absolutely do nothing. And for any of us that have been in the legal profession for any amount of time, there are probably at least a handful of law firm examples where the founders waited way too long to do anything about succession planning. Either it wasn't diplomatic to bring it up, they were focused on client work, they've got all these other excuses as to why they didn't do it. And by the time they finally got around to doing it, it was too late for the firm and the firms don't exist anymore. But we wanted to bring up on this webinar that doing nothing is absolutely an option. It's not one that we would advise, but it is an option to you. The other option is essentially to plan. And there's a variety of different ways that you may plan from a succession perspective. Finding successors to your practice is an option, mergers, acquisitions, combination sales. There's a bunch of different language out there as to different ways of making this happen. But really, from an options perspective, what we're trying to communicate today is you can either do nothing or start to think about based on your firm, based on its size, based on its culture, based on the people that you have in seats there, what kind of planning options are absolutely available. And um, I think to kind of kick off the discussion here, Randy, I wanna to come to you. Um, from, a, from a senior practitioner's perspective, What's in it for the founders? Why would it be advantageous to have this discussion sooner rather than later with the founders of the firm? What's in it for them? Well, I think people want to control their own existence and control their destiny. But the really difficult decision for the founders to, to think about is what do they really want? And is there, it, it, with a mid sized firm, I mean, do all of the partners? feel the same way. Because first there has to be that realization, do you just want to max out the, <laughs> the amount of money that's possible up to the very end and then shut the doors? Because that that's it's not the preferable model, I don't think, but it is a model. And Jonathan, as you've said, we've all seen that happen where people decided you don't want to invest in the future. You just want to max out. You've got a certain client base. At a certain point in time, the founders are going to either retire or pass away, and then it's over. And that, it's a model, probably not the best. The other things that are thinking, that founders are thinking about is client, have to be thinking about, is client continuation. I mean, if they actually care about their clients, they've got to think about what's going to happen when I pull back. And if they have those close relationship with their clients, they're going to want to make sure that their clients are taken care of and are being delivered the same level of service that that you have been providing to them. And then the third issue that I think that most firms are grappling with is this whole issue of legacy. And do you want to be a firm that's going to survive beyond, from a founder's perspective, beyond your term at the firm? And that's when you get, that's what it gets more interesting from my perspective and much more exciting. Do you want to create a team that's going to continue on and build a team that will continue on long after the founders are gone. And so to your point, Randy, it really comes down to what path do you want to take? Are you interested in something short term, which means maximizing what you have and letting the firm close its doors once that's over, or being more concerned with leaving a legacy, uh, really developing those professionals in uh, younger professionals at your firm, so they're able to take over from an internal leadership position they're able to take over from a rainmaking position externally and keep and continue the reputation of the firm moving forward. Right. And you have to make that decision while you've still got some runway left if you're a founder. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't make that decision at the last minute. 
so that's the importance of these sorts of meetings and these webinars is to really take a moment and think about it because sometimes people think about it when it's too late and they can't really change something if you're going to build a team you're not going to build a team in a year in a week or a month or even a year it takes years to really build that culture so, yeah good point good point Jason, I know when we when we verbalize the term succession planning, a lot of us immediately go to that conversation that we're going to have with a senior practitioner, essentially asking them, what is your time frame? What is your timeline? You know, how soon can we turn you out to pasture? But succession planning is way more than that. What are some of the other considerations in your opinion, in addition to the senior practitioner? either taking on another role or retiring altogether. Right. So you have those circumstances where you know there's a long runway and you can kind of plan ahead. But I think it's equally important to have policies in place to address um, the surprises. You know, if someone, if a partner is suddenly becomes ill or disabled or, or you know, God forbid, dies, um, if there's a, 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 an unexpected change in firm leadership, um, you need to have plans in place to, to make that transition as smooth as possible, both for the firm and for the clients. And, um, you know, for, for a smaller firm like ours, where, where partners are largely kind of managing their own, their own practice group and there are one or two people in a practice, it can be difficult to seamlessly hand off matters and clients when it happens suddenly. So, you know, last year we had a partner who, um, who, who became ill and had to take some time away. And, um, and, you know, because we had thought ahead, it wasn't a fairly easy handoff. And because we think of our clients as belonging to the entire firm, um, we, we were all sort of aware of the status of his clients more or less, and we're able to, to move into that. Um, the more siloed, the more uh, of a kind of solo practitioner mindset uh, your partners have, um, the harder that can be to do. Lana and I worked with a firm that brought us in. Uh, their challenge was they had too few rainmakers. The five rainmakers that they had were feeding 100 attorneys at the firm. The five rainmakers were anywhere probably in their late 50s to their mid to late 60s. And they were originating a ton of work, but there were way more timekeepers at the firm that the firm wanted to develop to take some of the stress off of these five guys. Um, 18 months after Lana and I started to work with the firm for various reasons, Jason, you bring up surprises and you just never know what could happen. Right. 18 months after working with this firm on developing future rainmakers, three of the five rainmakers of the, the firm had passed. Wow. And although that's an, perhaps an extreme situation, one of them got pneumonia, went into the hospital to be treated, happened to get a staph infection, was dead in a week. This was someone who was super active, super healthy, would run a couple marathons a year. I mean, no one would have guessed that that would happen to that partner. But the point of this conversation is succession planning from an organizational perspective is just good governance. It's more than transitioning senior practitioners out of the practice. It's looking at the whole practice to Randy's point and saying, what are we doing with our youngest professionals? Are they really the types of professionals that we can develop, move up through the organization with the hopes that one day they'll take over for us? Again, from a rainmaking and an internal leadership perspective, or are we just hiring laterally? And as long as the person has a million dollars a book of business and they somehow fit into our, our roster of attorneys, they're part of the firm. Lana, I'm sure there are probably other um, transition or succession issues that make this process challenging. You're on mute. <laughs> it wouldn't be a webinar without someone talking on mute. <laughs> so, you know, Randy and Jason uh, already touched on kind of all the reasons why we should be doing succession planning. So I think it's worth exploring why is this so challenging? And I think looking at the founders is, is a good place to start. So we see that founders are most often very talented lawyers, skilled marketers, 
risk takers, all these qualities that serve them so well through their careers, uh, but they, they inherently created challenges for this effective transition down the line. We see that they often uh, looked for lawyers when they were growing the firm who had the ability to, to service the clients that the founders generated. They weren't looking for attorneys with the same leadership and marketing skills that they had. They oftentimes were telling these new attorneys they didn't need to develop new business, just focus on the work that they're handed. And this common misstep in the approach to recruiting not only discouraged the best candidates, but tended to result in attracting associates who are looking for a job, not those who are looking for a, an opportunity to own or lead a law, a law firm. And as a result, the hired uh, attorneys assumed a supportive role and didn't develop the skills necessary to successfully lead the firm. So we'll discuss the various solutions to these frequent challenges to succession planning. Um, and we've found that the most important keys for leadership to consider today are hiring practices, compensation and culture, and investment into the development of attorneys. Usually this conversation on succession planning focuses on the most senior practitioners and what their responsibility is as it comes to transition or even law firm management. And um, we really thought it was a more interesting conversation to take the perspective of the Jasons of the world of the next gen to say, does he have a role in making this happen at his firm? And if so, how can someone, how can the next gen position themselves to one day have a conversation about succession. Jason doesn't need to join a firm and 24 hours later hit up management, you know, the Randys of the world and say, okay, buddy, when are you stepping aside? So Jason, you know, from your perspective, from that next gen's perspective, how does someone in your position even broach that topic? Uh, I think some of my partners would tell you that I basically did walk in the, the first week and, say, <laughs> and say, so what are we doing? Uh, but that's my personal style. Um, I think, you know, first of all, you, there, there are no shortcuts here. And so developing your professional excellence is the first thing. You got to be a good lawyer. You got to know your business and your practice. Um, and then you got to you got to build your reputation in the industry. And among clients, you got to build your reputation and your relationships and be prepared to bring in business. Um, so, you know, having a foundation, your own platform is, I think, the first is the first step. Um, then, you know, uh, I think it's different for different firms and it depends on the size of the firm. In our case, we are looking for, for people uh, before they become a partner and certainly before they become a, a senior partner. Um, to develop business. You know, I'm told there was a time uh, back before the crash when, when, when the rule was really keep your head down until you're a partner and maybe for your first 10 years of partnership and, and, and don't worry about business development for a while. Um, and that may be true. You know, I came from, from a big law firm uh, where I was for many years. And in some ways, uh, I think that model is still true in big law. People um, it's a long time until you're out there developing business. In smaller, in smaller firms, we're looking for people to, to you know, start um, contributing to that as soon as they have their professional legs under them. Once they've developed some, some skill and expertise as an attorney, um, then, then we want to start seeing that you're out there bringing people in. And then um, other steps to kind of prepare yourself for, for stepping into leadership and stepping into ownership of the firm is, um, you know, a, gaining a deeper understanding of your firm, of your business, of your client mix, of where there are gaps in your client mix. So that you have something to contribute to the discussion and you're not just saying, you know, how soon do I get your clients? You know? And so I've heard a couple of things from you, Jason. Number one is it's not next gen's responsibility just to wait on the sidelines until someone comes to them and says, Absolutely. by the way, Jason, would you like to take over my practice? Right. So that is not appropriate. There are things that you can be doing in parallel to prepare yourself. And then I'm also hearing that no longer is it good enough just to be an excellent attorney to really perform at your highest level you got to learn to be an excellent attorney and you got to be able to market on some level. You got to have both of those skills. 
which I think to your point is very different than perhaps when Randy was growing up through a firm, he was probably admonished, learn to be an excellent attorney and everything else will come in its due time. Now that model has changed and we got to think about that. Randy, assuming that everybody does as Jason suggests, um, does next gen have a role internally? And if so, what, what can they do to initiate that conversation? What can they do to prepare internal audiences to have the discussion? I think they've got to kind of earn it. <laughs> you know, I think that it's just like anything else. I have to go out there and earn my clients trust and respect. And next gen's got to earn my trust and respect because eventually for me to turn my clients over to next gen, I've got to trust and respect them. So I think that that's really what it's all about. Now that it's not like a, a huge hurdle, you know, but it does take time and it takes sensitivity to others. And I think that part of the problem is that people tend to talk more and listen less. And I think it, it, a really helpful concept would be to try and listen and try and hear what, what, what boomers want, which their clients want, and then talk with them. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of simple. And, and really, in, like in my firm, I work with a lot of younger lawyers. I love working with younger lawyers. They know, like, don't send me an email if they really want to talk with me come in at 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, when we're normally back in the office, come in, sit down, and I'm happy to talk with you and strategize with something. And that way, you actually develop a real relationship. And I'm willing to spend time with them. And then I've done that over the years, and a lot of those young lawyers are now partners on their own, have developed their own books, have the same philosophy. And yeah, it kind of sucks for me because I have to start with the next gen again, the next next gen. But I'm really happy to see that happen. But they had to kind of say, when's a good time to talk to Randy versus saying, Randy, you should talk to me on my time because I'm a busy guy. <laughs> and just like any other relationship, you're not going to walk into someone's office and demand something and expect for the boomer to be totally thrilled about whatever it is that you're asking for. Just like any other relationship, you get to know the boomer, you get to know their practice. Randy, to your point, literally having the conversation at some point, what do you want the future to look like for you? Absolutely. How can we make this a win-win to where I get to evolve as a professional, both on the rainmaking side and the internal leadership side of the firm, but you also get what you want. Maybe it's that legacy that you want. Maybe it's continuing to earn a certain amount of compensation that you want. But unless we actually have the conversation and we broach it in a way that's conversational and based on a relationship, we're just picking stuff out of the dark, hoping that it resonates with you. Right. And I think that that's the having that you've got to develop the relationship. It takes time to develop the relationship so you can have that honest conversation. But once the relationships develop, Lots of time trust is established. Yeah, it's established. Then it then it can take. And, it, it, and I, I think that as in lots of things with life, timing's everything. I mean, you don't want. I mean, I think there's a certain there's an appropriate time, and I think that people have to be sensitive to that too. And so, in terms of timing, do you trust your gut as the next gen? Um, how do you go about determining when that is? Because if I'm the Jason. I'm chomping at the bit. I want that salary. I want that empowerment to be in control of, of clients. I might want to head that internal committee. I might want to be a practice group or an industry group chair. And when you talk about timing, put me in coach. I was ready yesterday. <laughs> well, I, hear, I hear you. And I think you've got, I mean, I think everybody has to be sensitive to these issues. I think the boomers have to hear, they have to be sensitive to the younger lawyers coming up, but the younger lawyers have to listen too. And I think if you develop, people know if there's really a team-like culture and it's taken us a long time in our firm to develop it, but I think people feel it. And once you have that team-like culture, people want the younger people to emerge. You know, it just came, you know, we're at the time of the year when we're doing compensation from last year. 
and you know in our compensation models back in the past some of our younger partners they felt like you had to kind of work your way up and like you got kind of dinged your first years in you know because you know they thought you had it was just an old model and now we're saying we sh we should treat people fairly from you know all the way along and you don't have to kind of earn your way down. You don't have to have a couple of years where we whack you just like you're pledging you or something like this. It's it's a these are old models that don't work anymore. And I think that the models that do work are auto models of transparency, models of clarity, and moder, models of of honesty. It seems like the the ultimate element of what you're talking about, Randy, is really for there to be mutual trust at a firm between practitioners. And Absolutely. until that trust element is there, it's definitely not the right time for either person. Um, and, you know, building that trust just with anything else from a relationship perspective, you might be able to build that in 24 hours. It may take six or seven years to get the job done. Right. And I'm not so sure there's a ton that someone can do um, to force that time frame. There's definitely things you can do to build trust. In fact, Lana, there, there are probably some components that are worth reviewing as it relates to, to how to do a better job of building trust. Well, I just happen to have this slide here. <laughs> <laughs> that is so uh, handy. Oh. I do think it's especially relevant now uh, as people are kind of rethinking how they're building relationships. And like Randy already mentioned, you know, having someone come into your office, I think people uh oftentimes think that being physically close to someone creates a relationship but the truth is you need to create trust and there's components of trust that are universal and you don't necessarily need to be in the same room to to efficiently check all of these boxes so you know we've we've kind of reviewed all of these competency congruency and authenticity fairness transparency openness and vulnerability, reliability and dependability. I think, you know, if you're talking to your senior partners and being honest about what you want out of your practice, that is necessary and, and being very clear and, uh, and transparent and fair, um, all those things go a long way. And like Jonathan said, none of this can be rushed. It takes time. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning that, you know, if you're looking at succession, you need to also transition your clients. Um, and that takes time because you need to build trust. So all of these components um, are, are worth considering as you're building trust with existing clients that you hope to one day take over. All right. So uh, Jason mentioned the foundation a lawyer needs to, to achieve before they can reasonably be considered for a succession opportunity. Um, and there's no way to circumvent legal acumen and skill and having strong ties to the market and visibility with your target audience is usually necessary in building a book of business. Um, so you've done all these things Jason has suggested and you've proven that you are a very capable attorney. Uh, so now senior attorneys should start calling you on the phone asking you to lunch to talk about how they're gonna transition to their, their practice to you, right? Yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> Sadly, that's not usually the case. Uh, so what can you do to best position yourself for succession opportunities internally at your firm? So first, you need to proactively raise your hand. You can't just be available. We're coaching Jessica, an associate working with 25 lawyers at her firm, 25. So she couldn't develop meaningful practice expertise as all her lawyers were in different practice areas. Uh, her work product wasn't that great because of that. And she was basically looked at as a last resort. So you can imagine how the partners uh, treated her and what those interactions were like. And her only real value was that she was available. And she was on the fast track to total burnout. Uh, so not until she picked a practice that she was really interested in and started to proactively approach those lawyers looking for opportunities to work with them, did she feel she was in control of her practice and moving towards a successful career track. So some other ideas. Once you've identified a practice area you wanna pursue, ask the senior attorney, what they like doing the most and what can you take off their plate so they can do more of that. 
You can look for substantial business opportunities you can bring the senior attorney in on. Getting a meeting is often the hardest part of business development. And the next gen attorneys we coach that uncover opportunities, get the meeting and bring in a senior attorney to help them secure the work are usually in the best position to build trust and expertise with that partner. If you hear of a new client the senior lawyer secured or an opportunity that they're working on, do some research and see if you can uncover insights or valuable information you can present to the senior attorney. And look for ways to add value to existing clients uh, in the, the practice area. You can proactively look for introductions you can make. Anything you can do to broker relationships with senior partners is going to bode well for you. Let me stop this share. Randy, how would you feel if, if Jason heard, if you're both practicing at the same firm, let's assume for the hypothetical, Jason hears that you've pitched a sizable prospect and he walks into your office and says, hey, I understand you're bringing in Acme Corporation, you're pitching them. I happen to run that name through my LinkedIn and I've got three contacts that I'm connected with on LinkedIn um, within the organization that may be able to help us out on some, on some level. Jason's not committing to anything personally. He's just saying, hey, if it would be helpful, I'm connected with these three people. How, how would you view that as the senior practitioner, Randy? Well, me personally, I'd love it. I can't say all people of my generation would, to be quite honest. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, our firm is a little bit unique in that regard because I think we've, it's taken a while, but we've really created this team-like culture. And I think that that's, when we talked about planning for the future, I think that that situates you where you're much better situated for the future. So I, personally, I think it'd be great. And I'd, you know, I'd sit down and say, let's let's talk about it. Let's strategize. Let's do you that. You know, you do this. You do that. And have a lot of. I mean, to me, it should also be fun. And I think it's fun to work with Jason. It would be fun to work with Jason. How can we do this? What are we to do? How you know what, what? And to me, it's like a problem and solving it. And I like solving it with someone. So to me, it's not going to be a problem. I can't say that all people of my generation feel that way because if, we did grow up in, in a more siloed environment. And so if Jason's faced with that, it's tough. I think he's going to have to listen and he's going to have to develop a, a relationship with that person and that trust and show that he could add value. And I think even the more siloed people will want to make sure that they can have the best value. You know what I mean? So the best, the best relationship with that client and Jason's, of the caliber, I mean, why would I want to separate, you know, you just got to talk with the person and listen to them and let them come to it, I think, in their own. But I think in their own, if they're intelligent people, they will probably loosen up. And, and what message, Jason. what message would that send you, Randy? You know, let's assume Jason's in the same practice group that you are, but maybe you guys don't work together all that often on cases. By him coming to you and saying, hey, you know, I, I heard through the grapevine or I overheard someone mentioning that you're going after Acme. You know, I, I essentially found a couple contacts that may be helpful to you. What, what message does that intimate? That we're all on the same team. That's, how, that's the way I take it is we're all working together. It's a great step on Jason's part to say, hey, I'm here to support you, support the firm. You're here to support me. I'm here to support you. And all of a sudden we're creating a really good culture. So that's, that's what I hear. And Jason, for you to insert yourself into an environment like that, where no one asked you to do research, no one asked you to look at your Outlook contacts, for you to insert yourself, does that take a whole lot of energy? Are you overstepping your bounds somehow <laughs> by doing that? Once again, I, I might be the anomaly because I don't mind overstepping my bounds either. <laughs> you know. uh, so, uh, but no. And so... You know, again, I think our firm is is similar to Randy's. You know, we are as among the partners, uh, we're there's not really a hierarchical structure, even if people have been are more senior at the firm. Um, and so, for us, it's a matter of routine. You know, we, if we're pitching something, the word goes out that we're pitching something, and and we try to capitalize on every relationship um, immediately. Um, and it, you know, we're it's 
very, very much a, a teamwork environment here. So it wouldn't really fly if someone was like, oh, this is my pitch, don't, yeah. don't step on it. Um, but if it were that kind of culture, I, um, you know, the politics of how all this works is, is a big part of it. And, and figuring out how to, to have the right kind of relationship with each individual, that's true in any firm, even if there's teamwork, you have different kind of interactions. Communication is critical. Um, and really understanding, again, understanding your firm, understanding the client, um, getting yourself positioned for, for stepping in it is critical. Yeah, good point. Let's switch topics now for a minute and talk about how does one go about valuing the client relationship? Like what is a partner worth? What is their practice worth? How do we transition these client relationships in a way that um, is possible for the next gen and also makes it worth it for the, for the transitioning partner? I was on a phone call a couple of weeks ago with a firm that is uh, going through the succession planning process and they've hired an outside valuation firm to let the partners of the firm know essentially what the firm is worth. And there are four equity partners in this situation. All of them own 25% of the firm individually for a total of 100. And this valuation came in and said that every single share of the 100 were essentially worth a million dollars. So the executive director says to me, Jonathan, for those younger next gen attorneys, the Jasons of the world that are looking to buy into the partnership, they get 1% for 1 million. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way number one, that the next gen could ever afford that. And number two, the next gen would be silly to ever buy into that situation. They might as well leave the firm altogether, start their own firm than to be saddled with millions and millions of dollars trying to pay out these senior practitioners. I just don't think it, I don't think it works regardless of what the valuation company has come up with from a practical perspective. I just don't think it works. Um, Jason, from your, from your perspective, um, how can the next gen take a look at their firm, take a look at the different elements of the firm to really decide if there is an opportunity for them to grow and progress there? Well, uh, so this is, I had this experience not that long ago when I moved from, from a big firm to, to Han and Han. Um, so I think the first thing you wanna look at is that is there some longevity to the firm? And so when I was coming here, you know, it was a 120 year old firm. So I knew that it, it had a track record. That does not mean as we have seen many times that success is guaranteed. Um, you have to stay relevant. You have to stay uh, mindful and, and intentional about um, transitioning from one generation to the next. But longevity was the first thing. Um, the, the sort of relevance and currency um, of the practices, um, it, you know, are you, is it a forward looking firm or a backward looking firm? Um, the breadth and depth of the practices, that can be a little bit hard to tell from the outside before you come in. Um, so for example, you landed a firm, they've got a thriving real estate practice, but they essentially have one practitioner that has the overwhelming majority of the business. So this is key. And our, our relationship shared across the firm with clients or do clients belong to a partner? Um, and, you know, again, we're, we're a teamwork kind of firm. So we truly... Every partner belongs to the uh, every client belongs to the firm. We don't think of them as being associated with one partner. Um, but so all of those things that go to teamwork, I think, are people willing to collaborate across the firm and across industries? Are 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 senior people sharing their experience and their contacts uh, with other people at the firm, or are people really looking at their own kind of? eat what you kill, this is mine, don't touch my stuff. Um, because I think it's, you know, it's very hard to, to create a healthy succession culture if everyone's trying to hang on to what's mine, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And Randy, in your experience in management, when, when those senior practitioners come to a point where they either come to you and say, hey, at some point in the not so distant future, I'd like to think about transitioning and what that looks like. Um, 
does Irvin Cohen have uh, kind of a specific partner track for that? Or, you know, once you don't meet those equity partner requirements, um, then you're kind of turned out to pasture. How, how does this transition work from a practical perspective at the firm? Well, we're a, we're a mid-sized firm, so we have a lot more flexibility. Um, and when you talk about transitioning, I think there's two aspects. One is the pension type payment, you know, something so that you put in 20 years or 25 or 30 or 40 years at a firm, do you get something, some sort of payout at the end? And then the other issue is the relationship with existing clients, the transition of existing clients. And so I'm a newbie at Urban Cone and Jessup. I've only been there about 18 years, <laughs> you know? And so our firm's been around 75 years, not as old as Han and Han, but it's been around a little while. Yeah. yeah. And when I came to the firm, we basically had just retirement and we had a, a pension after 20 years, you'd get X number of dollars over a period of time. And about five or six years ago, we wanted to transition some people, but they really still had a lot to give to the firm. So we developed a category called senior partner. And so before they went into retirement, they could go to the senior, senior partner where they would still have a role, a meaningful role in the firm. They'd still have their pension benefits that they could get after they were senior partners. So they had the option. And this enabled people, some people who didn't really want to go into a full retirement to still become active in the practice. As time has gone on, that whole concept has evolved into different things. Now, we're, as I said, we're a, a, a smaller, mid-sized firm. We're about 55 lawyers. And so we can afford to have that flexibility. If you have a larger firm, I think you probably need to have more rigid rules. If you have more flexibility, then management's going to be in the difficult situation of having to tell people things they don't want to hear sometimes. And so the benefit, that's the benefit of rules. But I think the one thing we've learned through this whole COVID crisis is the importance of flexibility. And if you can be flexible, and manage your, and kind of adapt to the information, the data that you have at that point and change with the times that things happen. And so we've managed to kind of get through this whole period and it's kind of, we've emerged a stronger firm and a better firm. And I think the flexibility, the candor that we had for each other and the, you know, the, the transparency and the flexibility enabled us to do that. So whereas the team, I want to jump in and say that so much of this is about communication is really just about real authentic relationships among people. You know, these are, these are human issues and yep. you can't really underestimate the, the importance of that, you know, just developing relationships with your coworkers. Right, and when you talk about the, that authenticity, I was looking at Lana's slides and I think the thing that is actually, when you wanna talk about developing deeper and more authentic relationships, I think the one thing that you have to, if you can show your vulnerability it really opens up a lot of doors. A lot of lawyers don't want to do that, especially you and I, Jason, you were both litigators. That's not right. something that we generally right. talk about. Yeah. We don't go to court and you know, open our kimonos, so to speak. You know? <laughs> but I mean, but I think that it's something that's really important. When you talk about partners, showing that vulnerability takes it to a whole different level. Really, and really agree. And whereas we hear about perhaps larger firms that have mandatory retirement clauses in their partnership agreements, and maybe they have to if you've got 6,000 attorneys at the firm, I think what I'm hearing from both of you is um, the more creative you can get with your talent, the better it's for the talent and it's better for the firm. Just because you turn 65 years old doesn't necessarily mean you don't have substantial value to offer your organization. Um, you don't necessarily have to be one of the top rainmakers of the firm to be a value. Maybe there's another role that you can take on. Maybe you start transitioning your relationships at that point and start to mentor younger professionals, start to impart that expertise, industry expertise to younger professionals. And like Randy said, you're kind of in it together as a team. I think as a when you... I think when you have that real, if you actually create that real team, that's what's happened with our firm. And so we've 
really haven't had to have those difficult conversations with people. If you're really a member of the team, you don't want to hold the team back. So if you know that you can't participate at the same level of other equity partners, our, our equity partners have voluntarily come to me or to my co-managing partner and just said, hey, you know, I, I don't want to do it at that level. I still want to be involved, but I want to change my relationship. And we're lucky enough that we can be flexible and work it out. And so this is a win-win. Yeah, and, and for those at firms out there, Randy and Jason, where the conversation is going to be awkward from the gate, I mean, both of you seem to have pretty open organizations where there's at least a minimum amount of trust there and people really appreciate and value that. There are also firms out there where none of that exists. Randy, to, to your point, how do you think someone in Jason's position has a conversation with someone more senior if the Jasons of the world know it is going to be awkward and it may not be received in such great benevolent light that you've discussed? Jason's not going to like my answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, you know, talk less, listen more. I mean, I think I, I actually, you're going to actually have, be more persuasive. I, mean, I, I think you'll, you'll get what you want if you could get that person talking about re what really matters to them and listen to them, then you'll pick up on some cue and get that person. You're going to have to get that person to come there on their own. And that, I mean, it, that's a lot more difficult task. And so how do you get that person to come to see your side? And I think in that really, with that person, you just have to let them talk and talk and talk and you know, listen and listen. And then sooner or later, they're going to see the fallacy of their reasoning. I think that if they're smart people, they'll come to understand that they're missing something. That if they really want this to go on, they're going to have to get Jason involved. I mean, and, and have an honest discussion and like, where do you see this firm five years from now? That's an easy discussion. Where do you see this firm 10 years from now? Not that I'm pushing you, but where do you want to take this firm? And if they're being honest, and then how are we going to get there? Because the only way you're going to get there is by bringing the young people along. If you want to have a firm that's going to be around for 10 years. So that's, for me, that's the way I do it. I just say, you know, I really respect what you're saying. I want to hear, you know, but where do you see the firm in five years? You know, and, 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 and let's face it, when I first came to the firm, people were the mindset, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't, don't think these great thoughts. <laughs> you know, it's been lasting this way. Everything's great. What are you, why are you asking those questions? So, I mean, that you could start at that point, you know, where some people may be saying that to you, but in this day and age, I think that once you get past that, you could say, well, I just, I guess I'm crazy, but I want to know what's happening five years from now or something. <laughs> you know, and you're a smart guy, smart woman. What do you think? Where, you know, where are we going? Jason, are there other approaches, whether they're direct or indirect, for getting the conversation started? You know, it occurs to me in, in listening to the conversation, we might be talking about two different conversations that, that you need to have. One is at the kind of firm wide level. What are we do? How are we, how are we handing off all of this to the next generation and preparing the firm for longevity to become a hundred a 75 year old firm or 120 year old firm or whatever? And then there's the individual conversation with particular partners that you might want to succeed to their particular business. You know, you're you're the number two in line for commercial litigation, say. Um, and I think those conversations probably play out really differently. I think the, the, the conversation with an individual is, you know, necessarily touches on a lot of things, questions about, you know, really human things, about, about legacy, about recognizing your own mortality. So I don't think you go marching in saying, hey, you're looking old, what's happening? <laughs> um, but you do, and again, it sort of depends on your relationship. With those kinds of conversations, if you're not able to kind of broach it directly, and I do think the approach of just saying like, where do you see us in five years? Um, because naturally it comes up where you see yourself in that, you know? Um, but I think you can approach other, if you have a better relationship with another senior partner and say, hey, I'm not really, I don't really have a sense of how this is going. And I don't have a lot of insight into when ex-partner is handing off or how. Um, so how can we facilitate that? 
you know, and kind of finding your allies in that conversation. Um, for the firm wide discussion, I think, you know, you can put it on the table at a partner meeting and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, sometimes that gets shut down and then you got to go find your allies to make sure the conversation can even get on the table. But um, it, again, it depends on sort of what you're talking about. If you're talking about just like it, it's smart business planning for the firm, that's a much easier conversation, I think, to bring up, at least in some cultures. Yeah. Than in others. Randy, in your experience, has COVID changed this conversation? And if so, how? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, I think that, and we don't know how, but I think that pre-COVID, everyone assumed that we all be in there for a minimum of five days a week. I mean, there's some people who lived a little distance away and there's a, there were a few partners who only came in four days a week. They worked one day from home. I think the post-COVID environment is probably going to be people we don't know, but I can imagine that people will maybe be coming in the office three days a week. You know, I think that they may be working from home two days or three days, you know, two days, you know, maybe a weekend day too, but I'm just saying that they're only going to be coming in three days a week. And so for people who are thinking about pulling back, I think we've seen flexibility. There's going to be opportunities for people to work in different capacities, contribute to the firm if they want to and create win-wins. I don't know exactly how that's gonna shake out. We have a partner who's going to go into a senior, was gonna go into a senior status and we're talking about doing something because him working remote has been so great that he wants to continue to stay on but not go on, you know, we're gonna have some sort of middle ground and we can afford to do that and kind of be flexible. And I think that you know, our firm's transition to the remote world really well surprising to a lot of the partners. It took a little bit in the beginning, but I think people are really used to it. You know, our, our bigger concern is transitioning back to the, you know, the pre back in the office situation, you know, how that's going to work. You so, might even have some partners that are more productive sitting at home rather than being in the office with all the distractions and everything else. It's not perfect for everyone on the generational spectrum at the firm. I, I would assume younger lawyers probably suffer a little bit more when the seniors aren't there to mentor them directly, but you might even, did any of you have more productive numbers or more productive partners as a result of the COVID situation? We had some more productive partners, um, but I, as, you're, as you said, Jonathan, I think the feeling at our firm is there's really a missing each other. The social, if you wanna have a culture, I think you need to be in person. And so we really like our culture. And if you wanna have that team, you've gotta really, nurture the team and it's hard to do it in zooms or <laughs> webinars things like it's just we try we've done all kinds of things but it's not the same as sitting around face to face with someone you know and so i think that we want to get back to that but having said that people are being pretty damn productive remotely now <laughs> yeah lana do you want to go ahead and throw up the slide of kind of the checklist that we've talked about in terms of what next gen can do to perhaps initiate this discussion at their firms? Sure. So um, just to kind of reiterate what we've gone over today um, and, and highlight the most important components, uh, this is what next gen needs to do to facilitate the process. So they have to produce excellent work they have to build meaningful relationships and market visibility. They have to prove that they have what it takes to bring in business. Um, they have to evaluate meaningful opportunities internally and build trust with senior attorneys while creating value for the attorneys they're learning from. They need to build trust with clients and they need to explicitly discuss a succession plan with the senior attorney and leadership. Um, so, you have the eight steps. It's pretty simple, easy peasy. <laughs> um, I think it's worth looking at other timeline considerations uh, that founders should be examining. Yeah, so in terms of timeline, uh, we would like to scratch on that a little bit. Um, these are different. You can go ahead and throw up the slide there, Lana. I think it's worthwhile. 
these are these are some of our ideas from a timing perspective. Both Randy and Jason have mentioned that succession planning doesn't happen when you've got 30, 60, 90 days to try to transition somebody. It's also not good from a governance perspective um, to only be reactive when there's a crisis. Randy, as you take a look at this list here, are there any that any of these six that have in particular um, been helpful at your firm? I think for us, it's really develop investing in professional development. Um, our firm was more like that firm that you talked about where it had a few rainmakers and then I, and when I first got to the firm and in a lot of great service partners and we've transitioned over time and we've done that through working with professionals and have helped us with our business development. We're now going to embark on a lot more talent management, retaining and developing the talent we have. Um, for our culture. So I think that those are the things that really create this cohesive, positive team. If you have that cohesive, positive team, you can withstand a lot of change. You can withstand emergencies, all kinds of disruption, people, you know, as you say, people dying, all these things. So I think that that is the key is to start as early as possible to develop that really cohesive team. And so you're, what I'm hearing from you is you actually include professional development in talent management as part of your succession planning for the firm, even if you're starting out 10 or 15 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's and what's happened is, you know, now we have our younger equity partners who are interviewing people. We create that culture from the time we're interviewing people. We talk about our business. We have business development training for people. We start, we're getting them in the culture from the interviewing process going forward. And obviously we have to be honest about it and we have to deliver on what we say we're doing. But we think that's a differentiator in, in, the, in the law business. And I think it's, it's, it's been a very good model for us. Yeah, Jason. 100% agree. I'm the hiring partner for our firm. And one of the things that we consider is, can I picture being a partner with this person? We bring people in with the intent that they're going to be here as part of the family of this firm for you know for the long haul which is you know becoming less and less common but we definitely are thinking of it from day one and, and i did think, it fit the culture and i think the important the way we demonstrate that is that we're willing to spend money on them on their professional development and that shows we're not just using them like a cog in some greater machine that we actually do care and that's how you create that team. One point about your timeline, Jonathan, that I, I think it can be even longer than five years, depending yeah. on, you know, if you, it, 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 we have a couple of partners with very particular expertise. And if you don't have someone in place to step into that, if they're not training into it, then it can, you know, you got to go out and find someone and, 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 and bring them along professionally enough to be able to inherit that, which I think may be longer than five years. We're finding, we're looking at a couple of 10 year timelines with, with a couple of people. Good point. Well, I think, uh, Jonathan, is there anything you wanna to add to the timeline? No, I think we've, we've hit on the, the major points. Great. Well, the reality is that the rate of change over the last 20 years has been breakneck. And because of automation and technical innovation, that rate of change will only continue to change, uh, to increase. So I'd like to invite you all to go back in time with me to 2004. Uh, that's three years BI before the iPhone. How much time and effort did you have to plan if you wanted to get a ride? or if you needed directions, or you had to get some groceries or find some obscure battery you needed to buy or find a specific indie movie or listen to a certain old song. Uh, so our lives, our daily lives have dramatically changed over the past 16 years because of technological innovation and automation. Now think back on what your law practice was like in 2004. How much has changed in regard to the way you deliver value to your clients? 